so tired of at and <laughs> And so uh, the plane was a Boeing 727-100. Uh, Apparently, he knew a lot about this plane, and that's it right there. Again, this case. Okay. Okay, so he hands the stewardess a note, and that's the note right there. It was pretty much like, he claims he has a bomb. He has a suitcase next to him. Apparently, also the stewardess thought, like, it was just him trying to give her his number. But she like ignored it. So we had to like call her back and be like, you want to look at the note? You want to look at the note? And so she gives it to the pilots. He claims she has a bomb. He asked for $200,000. And I looked at two websites. One said he asked for two parachutes. The other one said four. So I don't know. And then he also asked to have the note back. So there's no like evidence of him, you know, any evidence like, like handwriting and stuff. Um. So... Pretty much what they do is they circle around Seattle Tacoma until everything's ready. Um, they offer him like military grade parachutes, but he asks for more civilian ones, which kind of keys in like maybe he's not a professional at this. Um, when they land, he lets all the passengers go. He keeps on one flight attendant, I think the one that he didn't hand the note to, and then the pilots. They go to a remote area where it's like, I think it was darkly lit. And also there was an FF, FAA official that asked to talk with him when they landed. And he was like, no. And apparently the FAA official was going to say like, this is what happens when you commit air piracy and hijacking, and this is what can happen. And that didn't happen. Um, also, he landed to refuel. Come on. Why the plane? So they first, he says to go to Mexico City. And, but they say we're not going to be able to make it that far because they are going pretty slow for a plane um, below 150,000 knots and pretty low as well, below 10,000 feet. So he says, okay, we can refuel, refuel in Reno, Nevada. Um, back there, can you? I don't know why I put that. Anyways, but he makes the entire crew and everybody stay in the cockpit the entire time. So uh, right around 8 p.m., the uh, people in the cockpit get a red light that says one of the doors has been opened. So apparently he lowered the aft stairs, which that's a picture of some of the aft stairs, like down and apparently jumped off the plane around 25 miles north of Portland. And he only used one parachute, which... They wanted to, the people who gave him the parachutes wanted to, like, mess with them and stuff, so he wouldn't, like, get anywhere. But because he asked for two, people thought he was taking a hostage with him. So they decided not to do that. So that's, so you can kind of see the thought process. Yeah, well, it was in the air. What have you done? The internet. Okay, so uh, I already talked about the FAA officer. Um, so when your plane originally took off for the second time, um, they sent an F-106 fighter, which is this one, to go chase him down. But because he was going, because the plane was going so slow, they were pretty much useless and they couldn't do anything to like go get the plane. So they got Lockhead T-33, which is this one down here, to go follow the plane. But by the time the, they caught up to the plane, they, he already jumped out and was gone. Um, the police also tried to follow him like on the road to see where he jumped out. And the weather was so bad that they couldn't follow the plane. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. I forgot why I put that in there. So the nickname D.B. Cooper came from when, after all this happened, they were investigating people, and there was an Oregon man that had the initials D.B. Cooper, and they thought that was him. They quickly realized it wasn't, but one of the press, somebody in the press, messed it up and called him Dan Cooper, D.B. Cooper, and that stuck. So it's not D.B. Cooper, it was Dan Cooper. So the legacy, um, an eight-year-old boy a few years later 
found a bag of money that had the same serial numbers as some of the bills. And because of that, a lot of people think he's dead and didn't land. But almost all the evidence like in that area is gone because after Mount St. Helens exploded. Um, the FBI finally like stopped investigating the case July 2016. And still a bunch of people today are like, oh, this is what happened. This is what happened. And even like the Loki show on Disney Plus did a whole spiff on that. And that was kind of cool. But... So nobody knows who he is still. He like. Did he survive? We don't know. There was 45 years of investigation and they still have no clue what happened. Which is why this is so cool, because it's like the perfect crime, pretty much. Like, unless he died, but. <laughs> And it still remains a mystery to this day. Can you go? I got one question here. Yeah, did the passengers of the plane know about this? No, none of them had a clue, I don't think. Not often. So some of them were probably curious when they were just circling. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, no, they said it, it was. Not a plane that happens a lot. Yeah, it does happen a lot. They, I think it said that the pilots were like, we're just waiting for a landing area or something like that. Yeah. It's a it's a great mystery. It's a great mystery. No, good story. All right, good job. I want to hear about the lost cause now. All right, I'm ready. All right. So this is the uh, lost cause, but um. What is it? Well, it's a myth about um, the Confederate States, about the succession from the Union. Um, it's portrayed as a noble cause against Northern tyranny, aggression, agitation, whatever. Um, it also portrays itself up on the defense. Um, there's a lot of sub myths around it as well, like um, Black Confederates, War about Tariffs, a um, few others. And they portray the South as uh, heroes. So origins, um, basically right after the Civil War, all this stuff um, was starting. Um, um, didn't really hit its peak until the 1890s, until like the 1910s. That was really its peak. Um, tries to cover up the um, actual reasons for succession and justifies the actions of the government and individuals. The main points, um, South or the states could join and leave whenever they wanted. That's not true. Slavery so wasn't the uh, cause of the war. Um, they say tariffs, for example, um, slaves like it anyway, which is definitely not. And then uh, the North wanted to destroy the superior Southern way of life. So instead of wage, wage slaves and factory, have the beautiful plantations that everyone's happy with. So here's a sub myth of it that the war was about taxes and uh, tariffs. Um, before the war, Northern politicians and Southern politicians had debated about having tariffs or free trade. The South wanted free trade due to um, the cotton export. It would have been better for them. Um, there's also a claim that the South is paying 8% uh, of all the taxes for the um, federal government. Actually, according to the uh, Chamber of Comber Commerce, from July 1859 to June, or I think it's June of 1860, um, I think it was like $237 million worth of foreign goods arrived to the Port of New York, $207 million um under tariffs and that was 63.5 percent of all the government money that was made and there's a second myth um or a sub myth here about the black parrots it's linked to that like that slaves didn't really mind being slaves there was some slaves brought to the front um for just um menial tasks like cooking or transporting stuff and never actually fighting there was a rumor in the north however like i think frederick Douglass even addressed it during a speech about um allowing African Americans into the army. They thought there were some uh, slaves fighting the army, but there wasn't. And um, in reality, the Southern politicians would never allow Black Confederate soldiers. I, I do have a quote here from the uh, first Secretary of State for the Confederacy, uh, Robert Coombs. Um, he said, "Well, my opinion, the worst calamity that could befall us would be to gain our own our independence by valor of our own slaves instead of our own." The day that the Army of Virginia allows a Negro regiment to enter their lines as soldiers, they will be degraded, ruined, and disgraced. So the impact of it, um, 
hundreds of Confederate memorials and statues to um, like a, a common soldier like there or Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jefferson Davis, etc. Um, the Confederate flag, instead of just being prevalent for that um, wartime, the battle flag more specifically, um, it's stayed prevalent basically from the war to today. And during the 50s, 60s, I think we went over this, that it was a symbol of and or a symbol of segregation. And then uh, many Southerners still believe in the myth to this day. So in the US, there are some memorials outside um, the former Confederate States, like in Helena, uh, they're of course gone now. Um, some of the lost cops also believed here as well, or in the Confederate States, due to um, basically having history written by the losers in this case, might be the only exception to history written by the winners. And then in recent times, during um, the BLM protests and riots during 2020, um, there was a call for taking down statues, which a lot of them have, including the one here. Um, and 2020 has basically been the downfall of this myth due to just all the protests and the racism behind all those statues. Any questions? Good. All right, good job. Nice. In many southern states, today, um, the holiday on Monday is not Martin Luther King's birthday. Martin Luther King's birthday is Robert E. Lee. So, it still goes on. So, since Carla was going to go first, but she left for unstated reasons. Oh, what? How do you work? But you want to go now? Sure. You're being muted, right? Yes. I find it. Do you need one sec? Why do you have a picture of the house? Alright. Okay. Um, the Bermuda Triangle. I'm sure all of you have heard of this. Oh no. I'm so, I didn't do anything. It's all like when I bring up here. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Where and what is it? Um, like I said, most of you probably heard of it. But it's just a region in Western North Atlantic. Um, it's the location of Mr. Advancing's Cooper Planes and Ships. It's also known as the Devil's Triangle, which I have never heard of. Um, and it's the site of more than 50 ships and 20 airplanes. Um, some of the origins of it, some of the like first pieces of writing about it were in Fate Magazine, which Mr. Precious was this in a place of Fate Magazine, so that was interesting. And um, it was called Sea Mystery Out of Back Door, written by George Sand. He was the first to lay out the triangle shape, um, and he also mentioned Flight 19, which I won't talk about very much because it's about to attention on that, but, um, and several other plane experiences. And then one of the other earlier articles was called The Deadly Bermuda Triangle, and it was written in, for this magazine called Argosy, I think, which is a completely fictional magazine, so um, not very reliable. I'm not sure how it took off so well, but he it was written by Vincent Gaddis, and he was the first to lay out like a pattern of like, these planes and ships are disappearing here because it's in the Bermuda Triangle. Okay, so let me talk about some disappearances that happened. Um, this is a cabin called the Witchcraft, and it was um, operated by Dan Burrick, a hotel owner and yachtsman, and he was with Patrick Horgan, a priest. I'm not sure why they were together, um, but they took the cruiser about a mile offshore, which Obviously, it's not very far, which makes it so weird. Um, the propeller struck something and broke. They called the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard instructed them to set off a flare so they could tell where they were. Um, the Coast Guard arrived, and the boat or the passengers were nowhere to be found, and they were never found. And the person who received the call from Burrock um, noted that he didn't sound very concerned, and the witchcraft had a special flotation device. Um, I'm not sure what that was, um, but um, installed so that could have contributed to why he wasn't very worried. Um, this one, so this is about Airborne Transplant BC-3. This occurred September 28, 1948, um, and it was a scheduled flight from, this saved none of my edits. I changed a bunch of this and it didn't save any of it. So it's San Juan, Puerto Rico, to Miami, Florida. There were 29 passengers and three crew members. Um, the pilot informed the ground control that, um, from the ground control that the landing gear warning lights weren't functioning properly, the batteries were low, and they were also low on water. Um, so they delayed takeoff because of this, because because the batteries were low, they wouldn't have any way of 
two-way communication. Um, but they decided they would take off anyway because the batteries would theoretically theoretically recharge with the in-flight generators. Um, so they taxied. Um, they agreed to stay close to San Juan until the batteries recharged. Um, and they circled for all of 11 minutes, which obviously did not cover it. And they got confirmation from CAA, which is the Civil Aeronautics Administration, to proceed to Miami. Um, and there was high visibility that day, which should contribute to, like, it would be easier to find them and communicate with them. Um, but they never responded to calls from San Juan. And the last transmission put them about 50 miles off the Miami coast. And most of their transmissions were actually heard in New Orleans. And New Orleans um, communicated with Miami about the plane's whereabouts. Um, and there was a wind shift, and Miami and New Orleans tried to communicate the wind shift, but they were never able to contact the flight, and they never arrived in Miami. Um, there was a formal investigation by the Civil Aeronautics Board, um, and they found no probable cause. Two bodies were found January 4th, 1949, like 50 to 16. Um, San Juan is like over here somewhere, and then flying this way. It must have. Um, contributed to why they ended up all the way over here. Um, and a plane similar to the one lost was found by divers, but it's never verified to be the lost there. Okay, and the USS Cyclops, this is the last one, um, what occurred in March 1918. It was a 542 foot long Navy cargo ship. It had 300 men and 10,000 tons of manganese, which manganese is used um, for um, steel. Right, like um, it's used in to make steel. Uh, it sank somewhere between the Chesapeake Bay and Barbados, and it never sent out an SOS signal, despite it being equipped to do so. An extensive search, and they found no wreckage. And in 1941, two of its sister ships vanished along the same. Um, some supernatural explanations for this: uh, UFOs, wormholes. My personal favorite is Atlantis. If you all heard, like the Lost City. And their crystal energies, which surprisingly enough, I couldn't find anything about what that is. <laughs> um, and underwater alien bases. All of these are pretty hard to find information on because they're totally made up. But um, <laughs> and there's more information. Oh yeah, no weird. Um, some more realistic explanations: the methane gas theory. This um, chart is pretty good at explaining it. Basically, um, a bunch of methane would be trapped, and it would release all at once and um, reduce the buoyancy, and it would cause the ship to sink. Um, road waves theory is kind of strange to me. So it's when waves are formed by a storm, but they develop against the pattern of other waves, which create just more violent seas. Um, and the Sargasso Sea Theory, um, it's where in this specific area of the ocean, four currents um, are joining together and it creates an ocean dryer, which is just any large system of circulating ocean currents. So just more rough seas. Um, the Gulf Stream is a warm and swift Atlantic ocean current, ocean current um, that runs right through here. And Carl Krizen, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, he's an Australian scientist who did a um, decent amount of research on the Bermuda Triangle, and he said it was nothing but human error. By the way, there were heavy traffic, heavy air, and sea traffic. And the U.S. Coast Guard said that the number that go missing in the Bermuda Triangle is about the same as everywhere else in the world. Um, some of the cultural impacts, it reached peak popularity and notoriety in the 70s. And as you can see, there's a lot streaming from music, movies, TV, games. Um, they're all very originally named. Nearly every single release has either the Bermuda Triangle or Devil's Triangle in it. Yeah. So what do you think it is? Um, I like the crystal energies theory. Oh, That's yeah. my personal. Cool. Yeah, it makes sense. You've done a good job. Yeah, there's no real difference between there and any place now. Yeah. Like, but it makes for a good story. It was a big deal. Sure. Um, I didn't see the picture because I think no one. I guess we're gonna look at it together, but. Oh, the picture. We never got yeah. a picture. Okay. Like I have one. This I have one from far away, but it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. 
you'll come out of your basement. <laughs> Um, I lost yours. You have to remake it. Yeah, I can do it real quick. Give me one sec. Okay. <laughs> this is the wrong one. I made a different one. Like this wasn't. Unless did I submit the wrong one? Submit. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Then you Did you decide to do a different project? Here or something else wants to go while I. No, we're going to sit here and watch yeah. do this. Christian, would you would like to go. Yeah. Way to step up to the plate. <laughs> Well, you're on. I have to carry on. Oh, I see. Right, give me one second. <laughs> I have to start over with the air I have to go. Oh. oh. That, that, he dropped the mic after that. Oh, yes. Except for mine. This one is kind of not there, but the Punished Manuscripts, the mystery is behind them. So it exactly is this book. I guess uh, basically a long time ago, some mysterious journal was found by uh, someone, by uh, someone, and then it was uh, given to uh, I guess an, an I guess an astronomer called John D. He later gave it to this guy, James Emperor Rudolph II of Germany. But no bring what's no inbreeding whatsoever. Oops. Oh. Yeah, I guess uh, the later, maybe like a few thousand years later, was discovered by someone called Alfred Voynich, who was uh, basically a big like a book dealer during in Italy during the 1912s, and I bought the book and yeah, and kind of showed it to the world. They thought it was kind of interesting because basically the thing about this book is. They didn't know what kind of language it was in. It had a bunch of random pictures, and like no one really knows like what like what the contents really are. A lot of theories about it, and now it resides in basically a uh, young Yale University library. There, kind of resides to this day for numerous research. My favorite quote of the entire thing is by the son of John D. Astronomer. A book containing nothing but hieroglyphics, which book his father bestowed upon much time. But I could not hear that he could not make it out. That's a quote. Yeah, that's that, that's a quote. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, about the codex, said there are a bunch of pictures about like zodiac signs, fantasy creatures, even like a dragon, and some, some astronomical symbols like weird stars and stuff. Like I guess like different like things like that. I have actually numerous varieties of plants. I think they really exist, but were kind of just displayed in the book. They had probably the strangest one, woman in green water. I'm not really sure why. Ask, ask, ask the, whoever made it. Uh, possible language. I was not really sure. This looks like kind of like movie things. Contested by dozens of code breakers to kind of find out what exactly it is. And those those things they can find. Silence. Yep, backwards. Yeah. The bonus quest. Yep, that's that's dragon, by the way. So I guess during during this time, as it was uh, getting more I guess notoriety about people trying to find out what it was, there are various groups who tried to like find out exactly what it contains. The first 
guess one of the uh, biggest ones was the Friedmans, who basically, they were uh, the dynamic duo, but basically the big code breakers of the, of the time. They tried uh, numerous, uh, I guess tried numerous ways to try and find it out. I guess first just like manual, then they actually had more like uh, specific ways during World, uh, World War One and World War Two. Next was Arthur Tucker, who was basically uh, like a botanist who just said, hey, it's got to be like 16th century plants in America. People said no. Then there was Greg Kondrak, a computer scientist, basically kind of like, kind of like a little bit of, uh, I guess, a revolution about like trying to find it using like computers and like new technology. Still found nothing really, not really any big, at least. I like your fan if you look at me. <laughs> Serious. Um, yeah. Some people think maybe one South Manual for, I guess, other theories, aliens, because, I mean, I can kind of see it. Uh, other people, ancient Mexican cultures, because why not? Probably for some reason. Uh, Dark Arts Alchemy. Alchemy I guess, because plants and people is just, yeah. But I mean, as far as my personal theories, I think it's some of the weird pictures. They were written by a six year old. Because, like, the, I guess the big variety of like uh, picture qualities, maybe it has like multiple authors, maybe. Like, maybe like people keep adding onto it, maybe, or something like that. Yeah. And I guess, uh, yeah. I guess not, not really sure. Maybe six year old author, maybe multiple authors, maybe it's just like some kind of weird folks. Like it was written by someone for nonsense. And that's it. That's that is, it really is a weird thing. No idea what it is. It's, you know what alchemy is? Do you know what alchemy is? Why that might, they might use code? What is it? I mean, it's basically like whatever it is, look like just chemistry. Yes. To make all kinds of things, what's the big thing they really could make? The gold. Gold. And the gold. And the gold. That's what they try to bring it back. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Good job. Bye bye. Give me one. Give me one sec. We've got cap music. <laughs> I will get cap ivy music when we're done. Don't worry. We got it now. Okay. It's going to be the right way. Isn't it different? No, you just have to do that to get it. Yeah, so it'll be like three slides and then it'll be done. <laughs> it's like a different. No, oh, yeah, I didn't like mine, so I redid the whole thing. That's, not, that's a good thing to do. Okay. Okay. okay, so mine is the Black Dahlia. Okay, who is the Black Dahlia? So she was 22 years old, and her name was Elizabeth Short. She was living in, like, Hollywood at this time, and she was an aspiring actress, but there's no a man named Matthew Michael Gordon Jr., but he ended up dying in a plane crash. So she relocated to Florida, lived there for a while, visited her friend um, Joseph Gordon quickly. But then she went back to California and kind of was everywhere there and in L.A. a lot. Um, and she was working as a waitress before her death and lived behind a nightclub on Hollywood Boulevard. She was known as a man teaser because she'd like get men to like her and then she'd just drop them. And she was always like seen with a new man or dating a new guy. And um, her last six months were in, in California. Okay, so the nickname was based off the movie The Blue Dahlia, which came out like a year before her death. And um, 
it was because she wore like sheer black clothing all the time and her hair was like dark brown almost black and um she may have had the nickname before like during her life but no one's really sure and but they assume that the people at this drugstore that she always visited gave her that nickname and it was previously known as the werewolf murder just because of how like gruesome it was. okay so before the murder she returned to la after a trip with robert red manley and he was this married salesman that she was dating at the time um she was dropped off at the Biltmore Hotel and was supposedly like going to be picked up by her sister, but um, that wasn't true. And she was seen using the telephone and later was seen at the Crown Grill cocktail lounge, which is just like, just, it's pretty close to this. And this, these are pictures of the hotel. It's like, it's super fancy and it's very pretty. And you can go on tours today where they see the Black Dahlia haunts it and things like that. Okay, so this is pretty gruesome, but um, the body is discovery. So it was discovered by a local resident named Betty Bursinger. And she was found at about 10 a.m. in a vacant lot near Leemore's Park, I think. And it was on January 15th. Um, her body was severed at the waist and was separated by like about a few feet. And it had been completely drained of blood. Uh, there wasn't any blood around the scene, which was weird, but her body had been washed with gasoline to remove any fingerprints. Um, but there was a cement bag with some watery blood in it, like a ways away. And there was a high heel print in the grass, like where her body was found. And there was a Glasgow smile carved into her face, which is where they like cut your cheeks. Uh, and I use these pictures. This is like the most discreet I can find. But she had a few clean lacerations. So they assume that like a surgeon may have done it or used surgical tools because of how clean they were. And the technique was used was the endocorporectomy technique. And you had to have like, like surgical skills to do this. And because you had to cut their spine like between these certain vertebrae. Um, she also had blows to the head, and they, from the autopsy, they said she died from hemorrhage. So the investigation, there was a phone call to the newspaper where someone said they did it, but there were also like 500 false confessions. Um, a letter was sent to a, like, a newspaper press with her birth certificate, photos, names, and an address book, which had this man's name on and he ended up being one of the suspects. And these were also like clean with gasoline, but there were a couple fingerprints, but they were messed up during like the process so they couldn't use them. Um, there were also her belongings in a trash can like a few blocks away from where her body was found. And over 150 men were interviewed as potential suspects. Um, one of the original detectives believes he talked with the killer because someone said they saw someone in like a gray sedan by where her body was. And when they came up, his doors were all open. He like ran in the car and drove away quick. So they believe that might have, but they don't, the person was let off. And then Robert Manley, the guy that she was on a trip with before this happened, um, identified the belongings that were in the trash. Suspects. So the first was Walter Bailey. He was a surgeon and had family connections to the Black Dahlia. I think like his daughter was friends with her sister. Um, and his office was right next to the Biltmore Hotel. Um, and the body was dumped only a, a block away from his ex-wife's house. And um there, it wasn't confirmed if he had been seen with the Black Dahlia, but um, they may have spent a few days together and he had a degenerative brain disease, so they believe he may have just lashed out at her. Um, and his widow, he had like a couple lives, I think, but um, said that his mistress knew a terrible secret about him, um, like after he died. And... Short apparently would tell men that she had a son that died, and they think that she may have said that to him because he actually, and like 
this may have caused him lashing out um, because he actually did have a son that died just a couple years before. And she was killed two days after the anniversary of his son's death. So they also think that's why he made that. And then Leslie Dillon and Mark Hansen. So Mark Hansen owned the club that she lived behind. And um, uh, I believe that Leslie Dillon, and I think his name's John O'Connell, something like that, uh, killed her for Mark. Um, and especially because Mark's name was the one that was on the address book that was sent into the press. Um, and Jack Stan said Jeff, um, no, it was Jeff O'Connell. Jeff O'Connell killed her because she knew about an affair that Mark was having. But Jack Sand ended up being Leslie Dillon. And he, some of the details that he said about the murder weren't actually released by police yet. And they believe that she was uh, killed in the Astor Hotel because one of the rooms had blood all over in it, like around the time that she was killed. And it was also speculated that she knew too much about their schemes to rob hotels. Foxy Siegel was one. This one I didn't go into because it was kind of funny, but um, some believe that he was a hitman hired to kill her, but most likely not. And then George Hodel, he was like the prime suspect in who people believe, like who people today mostly believe did it. Um, <clears throat> his son was a detective and believed that he did it. Um, he was a sex offender and had a medical degree, so he would be able to do the surgical cutting. Um, his handwriting was similar to the letters that were sent in, and he purchased bags of concrete um, like a week before her death. And they actually w ended up wiretapping his phones, and that's what he said. And he was also accused of killing the secretary, but was never actually charged for it. Um, and he was always with new women and was kind of a partier in Hollywood, so he's um, probably had a relationship with her for a little bit. I think there were like eight um, people who could confirm that they had been together. So the legacy is, is one of the most famous unsolved cases ever. And um, a bill that was introduced because of it required for sex offenders to be on a registry. And there were um, a bunch of TV shows and movies made. And it's still in pop, pop culture today. People have shirts with the Black Dolly on it and costumes. And it's kind of a big thing just because it, it was in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. There's no sources. Any question? Yeah, this was a big deal. We could all get a shirt of that and D.B. Cooper we saw a shirt. All right, good job. Make sure you throw it out for that was, okay, no, that was good. All right, let me see, I think. Did anyone else get their way to go today? This is about it. It's about you ready? Yeah, I don't know. I think I can do it. Thanks a lot. See how it goes. Let's do it. Hey. Where's yours? I thought I got yours out. It's presentation six. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> okay, give me one step. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, just to preface, this is going to be really awful, and you're not going to feel great about this at all. Not um, the presentation itself. Yeah, but yeah, the but the, the story. <laughs> um, And also, I laugh when I'm very, very uncomfortable. So if I chuckle a little bit, I'm not chuckling at the situation. I'm chuckling because I'm very uncomfortable. Um, anyways, so I can't click it. Yeah, your mouth problems. Okay, so the murder. This is Joan Benet Ramsey. She was a six-year-old pageant queen, and she was killed. They want to say, um. They found her body at 5.52, but she was killed in her home the day after Christmas, December 26, 1996. Yes. Um, immediate suspects were her parents because the only people in the house at the time were her dad, her mom, and her little brother, who's only 10. Uh, the aftermath, and we'll go into it because it, it created such a public outburst and such a, like it is today with the Black Valley. It's a super big murder mystery that people are still trying to figure out. So we get to it. There we go. Okay. 
So background of the family, they were a very rich, um, affluent family. They were in a very affluent community um, that was like a gated community that you could, that they lived in. The father was very, very rich. He was the main um, money maker of the family. The brother, she had two. One was named Burke Ramsey, who was 10, year old, 10 years old at the time of her death. And then the other one who was 22 years old at the time of the death. And he wasn't actually at the house. And then the sister, she had two sisters. They, I couldn't get a lot about. One of them was named Elizabeth. She died before the uh, incident when she was just a baby. And then another one that I don't remember her name, but they had nothing about her. It was like she wasn't even kind of part of the story, which was a little weird, but so what happened before 5:52 a.m.? This is that's when police had discovered her body. Uh, so December 23rd, there was a 911 call from the Ramsey's house. They had suspected that it was probably a drunk person because there was a Christmas party they were having that day. Um, but no one really knows. It was kind of one of those weird quirks that was like, well, you know, there's something else going on. But they had suspected later that it was just a um, incident, like accident, accidental call. Um, so then they went to a Christmas party, December 25th, and they were fine. They were all, all of them went together. They went to a different house. They weren't at their own house and they had come back and it was late in the night when apparently, allegedly, Burke, the 10 year old, who that's, that's Burke, um, got in an argument with Joan Bonet about eating pineapple. And that was really weird because they had found pineapple actually in her digestive or in like it was caught in her throat like it was in her body when they found her like there was like uh we'll go into more how she was killed but you could there were signs of choking on a pineapple so and then there was a 911 call, call by her mother at 5 30 that morning um finding a ransom note that we're going to go into and which was really weird again because the ransom note talked about don't call 911 and she immediately called 911, but I probably would too if my six year old seemed like she got kidnapped. So they think the timing of it all was there was just this ransom note on the kitchen counter, and they had later found uh, Joan Bonet in the basement under a blanket. So it was the timing in which the parents had found the note, and when she was found, it was very weird, almost like that ransom note was just kind of put there as a red herring, you know, and was like, well, she's, you know, she was obviously already dead if that ransom note was put there, right? So the 911 call again, I thought it was pretty suspicious that the mother had immediately called 911, but again, that could just be a motherly instinct, like, hey, my six-year-old is, you know, missing. So I thought it was very, the, the ransom note was very similar to the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, like almost to the point where, it's like they took it and just like reworded it because it was like, um, basically talking about a Christmas bonus that the dad, like the exact same amount they were asking for, which was 118,000, um, was the same amount of money that the dad was getting for his Christmas bonus. So a lot of it was really weird. This is a picture. Basically, this is the mom's handwriting and this is the ransom note handwriting. Allegedly. Don't know how true that is, but also very weird. So this is the ransom note. Not gonna read it, but basically it's like we're foreign individuals. Uh Lindenberg baby kidnapping, they were also a foreign individual group. They wanted $118,000. They were like, don't call anybody, we'll contact you. Lindenberg baby kidnapping. It was <laughs> very, very suspicious. So the public outburst was incredibly insane. It was like over just a couple hours. It just kept going out everywhere, and there's still things that happen today, like 60 minutes. They have the 2020, which are all those murder mystery investigations. I mean, they had, they brought out another one just a couple months ago because of new evidence. So we'll actually talk about it later. So the harsh part about this murder case is the deaths of children was on a rise in 1996. In Chicago, actually, the Chicago Tribune um, came out with a article talking about the amount of deaths children um, the amount of children that were dying in Chicago due to gang related violence. So a lot of people were pretty upset that suddenly a white affluent little girl was getting all this attention from being murdered, but you know, all these other kids that were dying, being murdered, not the same way, not the same gruesome, but that idea, but they weren't talked about. No one was talking about them the way that they talked about her. 
Uh, so I feel like it had a little bit to do with race and also a little bit of sexism. If you look at um, kind of all the pictures they show of her, she's in her pageant dress. She's not in, I tried in my uh, presentation to put her as a normal kid because that's what she was, but I definitely feel like they really played on this murder of a little beauty, like this pageant queen, you know, she was Miss Colorado when she was six and stuff like that. Which just seemed very weird and just awful because this six year old, you know, was murdered. Uh, and just the nature of the crime, it was really awful. So essentially, she was found strangled. She was found with signs of sexual assault. Um, she, the strangle they believe may have been a red herring, but she, that's kind of how she died. She was just, it was, it was awful. I, yeah. There's this little video clip. I don't know if it'll let me do it. So just like kind of more of like how public It's really sad because you can tell she's just this sweet little girl and, you know, found murdered. So this is her mom. There's a couple theories. I'm going to try to go through them pretty fast. So a lot believe that there was an intruder, but there's also a lot of theories believing that that wasn't true because there were windows open, but on those windows that were open, the cobwebs there were, they were never broken cobwebs. So they're like, mm, how would there be an intruder? There was a housekeeper, but there wasn't really any signs that she was even there when it happened. Um, there was Santa who is, they called him Santa. It was a neighbor that had dressed up as Santa Claus that they had possibly suspected. In reality, they had no idea. They, they really thought the main investigation was on the parents because it was the only plausible like thing that they could do. So I, I have a little, I can just finish next week. You want to just cut it off right now and then come back? If you want to finish right now, we've got how long will it take? A few minutes? Oh, maybe, yeah. I, I, I want to talk. I want to hear it. So, uh, okay. You have to go to okay. class, go to college, wait for three minutes. That's nothing, right? Okay. Okay. So, then the mom, the mom was a very big suspect because of the nature of pageantry and how, you know, she was probably the main one taking her to pageant, stuff like that. They think that. Um, they got in an argument over her bed wedding the next, the previous night. It was, there was all these theories that were just really like, oh, I don't know, because they all seem so plausible, but at the same time, it's like, who would kill, you know, a six-year-old? And then the brother, they believed for a long time that Burke Ramsey, who was the 10-year-old, had done something. Um, there's evidence that he was asleep, and then there was other evidence that he was actually awake during the time when the mother found the raise note. Um, but again, he was 10 years old. They have three psychological evaluations on him and nobody ever, you know, they eventually dismissed it. So uh, Reich, who was a person who falsely confessed in 2006, was like, yeah, I killed her. And they were like, no, you didn't. Like, <laughs> like we have no evidence and we don't even know who you are. So breaking evidence, this actually kind of happened two months ago, uh, well, a little bit more, a couple months ago. They had essentially found DNA. They were able to do new test results on the DNA they found. And these blood particles they had found on um, in JonBenet's clothing, they basically had figured out it was the blood of an unknown, unknown male. So could it possibly lead them closer to figuring out who this is? Maybe it could also be a red herring. There was a lot of things that were like, why did they do that to her that could possibly to that? So my thoughts... I think it was an intruder. I want to believe it was, but in reality, I do think it was her parents. I don't want to say that because I, you know, don't want to feel like that's real, but I do believe that it was them just because they have the most um, evidence against them. Type. In conclusion, it was horrific. You know, it was awful. It's still talked about today. Um, it still hurts a lot of people. I talked to my dad about it last night. My parents lived 24 minutes away from where this happened in Colorado. So <laughs> it was, it was pretty big. You know, I, I it was before I was born, but it, that's scary for anyone. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you for finishing. Thank you for waiting. Yeah. Wow.
Good presentation today. And I will see you on Thursday morning, 820. Isn't that exciting? Do you want to be so perky, ready to roll? Goodbye.